Dead Souls, Part Two, Chapter Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dead Souls by Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol. Translated by D. J. Hogarth. Part Two, Chapter Three. Read by Ewan Bayliss. If Colonel Koshkarev should turn out to be as mad as the last one, it is a bad lookout, said Chichikov to himself, on opening his eyes amid fields and open country, everything else having disappeared, save the vault of heaven and a couple of low-lying clouds. Selifan, he went on, did you ask how to get to Colonel Koshkarev's? Yes, Paul Ivanovitch. At least, there was such a clatter around the Kolyaska that I could not. But Petrushka asked the coachman. You fool! How often have I told you not to rely on Petrushka? Petrushka is a blockhead, an idiot. Besides, at the present moment, I believe him to be drunk. No, you are wrong, Barin, put in the person referred to turning his head with a sidelong glance. After we get down the next hill, we shall need but to keep bending round it. That is all. Yes, and I suppose you'll tell me that Sivnka is the only thing that has passed your lips? Well, the view at least is beautiful. In fact, when one has seen this place, one may say that one has seen one of the beauty spots of Europe. This said, Chichikov added to himself, smoothing his chin. What a difference between the features of a civilised man of the world and those of a common lackey. Meanwhile, the Kolyaska quickened its pace, and Chichikov once more caught sight of Chenchetnikov's aspen-studded meadows. Undulating gently on elastic springs, the vehicle cautiously descended the steep incline, and then proceeded past water mills, rumbled over a bridge or two, and jolted easily along the rough-set road which traversed the flats. Not a molehill, not a mound jarred the spine. The vehicle was comfort itself. Swiftly there flew by clumps of osiers, slender elder trees, and silver-leaved poplars, their branches brushing against Salifan and Petrushka, and at intervals depriving the valley of his cap. Each time that this happened, the sullen-faced servitor fell to cursing both the tree responsible for the occurrence and the landowner responsible for the tree being in existence. Yet nothing would induce him thereafter either to tie on the cap or to steady it with his hand. So complete was his assurance that the accident would never be repeated. Soon to the foregoing trees there became added an occasional birch or spruce fir, while in the dense undergrowth around their roots could be seen the blue iris and the yellow wood tulip. Gradually, the forest grew darker, as though eventually the obscurity would become complete. Then, through the trunks and the boughs, there began to gleam points of light like glittering mirrors. And as the number of trees lessened, these points grew larger, until the travellers debouched upon the shore of a lake four bursts or so in circumference, and having on its further margin the grey, scattered log huts of a peasant village. In the water a great commotion was in progress. In the first place, some twenty men, immersed to the knee, to the breast, or to the neck, were dragging a large fishing net inshore, while, in the second place, there was entangled in the same, in addition to some fish, a stout man, shaped precisely like a melon or a hogshead. Greatly excited, he was shouting at the top of his voice, Let Cosma manage it, you lout of a Dennis! Cosma, take the end of the rope from Dennis. Don't bear so hard on it, Toma Bolshoi. Bolshoi being the elder. Go where Toma Menshev is, Menshev being the younger. Damn it, bring the net to land, will you? From this it became clear that it was not on his own account that the stout man was worrying, 
Indeed, he had no need to do so, since his fat would in any case have prevented him from sinking. Yes, even if he had turned head over heels in an effort to dive, the water would persistently have borne him up. And the same if, say, a couple of men had jumped on his back. The only result would have been that he would have become a trifle deeper submerged, and forced to draw breath by spouting bubbles through his nose. No, the cause of his agitation was lest the net should break and the fish escape. Wherefore, he was urging some additional peasants who were standing on the bank to lay hold of and to pull at an elder rope or two. That must be the baron, Colonel Koshkarev, said Selifan. Why? asked Chichikov. Because, if you please, his skin is whiter than the rest, and he has the respectable paunch of a gentleman. Meanwhile, good progress was being made with the hauling in of the baron, until, feeling the ground with his feet, he rose to an upright position, and at the same moment caught sight of the Koliaska, with Chichikov seated therein, descending the declivity. "'Have you dined yet?' shouted the baron, as, still entangled in the net, he approached the shore with a huge fish on his back. With one hand shading his eyes from the sun, and the other thrown backwards, he looked, in point of pose, like the Medici Venus emerging from her bath. No, replied Chichikov, raising his cap, and executing a series of bows. Then thank God for that, rejoined the gentleman. Why? asked Chichikov, with no little curiosity, and still holding his cap over his head. Because of this! Cast off the net, Tom Amenshev! and pick up that sturgeon for the gentleman to see. Go and help him, Telepen Kuzma. With that, the peasants indicated, picked up by the head what was a veritable monster of a fish. Isn't it a beauty? A sturgeon fresh run from the river? exclaimed the stout baron. And now, let us be off home. Coachman, you can take the lower road through the kitchen garden. Run you lout of a Tom Bolshoi, and open the gate for him. He will guide you to the house, and I myself shall be along presently. Thereupon the bare-legged Tom Bolshoi, clad in nothing but a shirt, ran ahead of the Koliaska through the village, every hut of which had hanging in front of it a variety of nets, for the reason that every inhabitant of the place was a fisherman. Next, he opened the gate into a large vegetable enclosure, and thence the Koliaska emerged into a square near a wooden church, with, showing beyond the latter, the roofs of the manorial homestead. A queer fellow, that Koshkara, said Chichikov to himself. Well, whatever I may be, at least I'm here, said a voice by his side. Chichikov looked round and perceived that, in the meanwhile, the baron had dressed himself and overtaking the carriage, with a pair of yellow trousers he was wearing a grass-green jacket, and his neck was as guiltless of a collar as Cupid's. Also, as he sat sideways in his drozhki, his bulk was such that he completely filled the vehicle. Chichikov was about to make some remark or another, when the stout gentleman disappeared, and presently his drozhki re-emerged into view at the spot where the fish had been drawn to land and his voice could be heard reiterating exhortations to his serfs. Yet when Chichikov reached the veranda of the house, he found to his intense surprise the stout gentleman waiting to welcome the visitor. How he had contrived to convey himself thither passed Chichikov's comprehension. Host and guest embraced three times, according to a bygone custom of Russia. Evidently, the baron was one of the old school. I bring you, said Chichikov, a greeting from His Excellency. From whom? From your relative, General Alexander Dmitrievich. Who is Alexander Dmitrievich? What? You do not know General Alexander Dmitriev Betashev? exclaimed Chichikov with a touch of surprise. No, I do not, replied the gentleman. Chichikov's surprise grew to absolute astonishment. How comes that about? he ejaculated. 
I hope that I have the honour of addressing Colonel Koshkarev. Your hopes are in vain. It is to my house, not to his, that you have come. And I am Peter Petrovich Pietuch. Yes, Peter Petrovich Pietuch. Chichikov, dumbfounded, turned to Selifan and Petrushka. What do you mean? he exclaimed. I told you to drive to the house of Colonel Koshkarev, whereas you have brought me to that of Peter Petrovich Pietuch. All the same, your fellows have done quite right, put in the gentleman referred to. Do you, this to Selifan and Petrushka, go to the kitchen, where they will give you a glassful of vodka apiece. Then put up the horses and be off to the servants' quarters. I regret the mistake extremely, said Chichikov. But it is not a mistake. When you have tried the dinner which I have in store for you, just see whether you think it a mistake. Enter, I beg of you. And taking Chichikov by the arm, the host conducted him within, where they were met by a couple of youths. Let me introduce my two sons, home for their holidays from the gymnasium, said Pyotr. Nikolasha, come and entertain our good visitor while you, Alexashka, follow me. And with that, the host disappeared. Chichikov turned to Nikolasha whom he found to be a budding man about town, since at first he opened the conversation by stating that, as no good was to be derived from studying at a provincial institution, he and his brother desired to remove, rather, to St. Petersburg, the provinces not being worth living in. I quite understand, Chichikov thought to himself, the end of the chapter will be confectioner's assistants and the boulevards. Tell me, he added aloud, how does your father's property at present stand? It is all mortgaged, put in the father himself as he re-entered the room. Yes, it is all mortgaged, every bit of it. What a pity, thought Chichikov. At this rate it will not be long before this man has no property at all left. I must hurry my departure. Aloud, he said, with an air of sympathy. That you have mortgaged the estate seems to me a matter of regret. No, not at all, replied Pyotr. In fact, they tell me that it is a good thing to do, and that everyone else is doing it. Why should I act differently from my neighbours? Moreover, I have had enough of living here and should like to try Moscow, more especially since my sons are always begging me to give them a metropolitan education. Oh, the fool, the fool, reflected Chichikov. He is for throwing up everything and making spendthrifts of his sons. Yet this is a nice property, and it is clear that the local peasants are doing well, and that the family, too, is comfortably off. On the other hand, as soon as ever these lads begin their education in restaurants and theatres, the devil will away with every stick of their substance. For my own part, I could desire nothing better than this quiet life in the country. Let me guess what is on your mind, said Pyotr. What then? asked Chichikov rather taken aback. You are thinking to yourself, that fool of a Pyotr has asked me to dinner, yet not a bite of dinner do I see. But wait a little. It will be ready presently, for it is being cooked as fast as a maiden who has had her hair cut off plaits herself a new set of tresses. Here comes Platon Mikhailich, father, exclaimed Alexashka, who had been peeping out of the window. Yes, and on a grey horse, added his brother. Who is Platon Mikhailich? inquired Chichikov. A neighbour of ours, and an excellent fellow. The next moment, Platon Mikhailich himself entered the room, accompanied by a sporting dog named Yarb. He was a tall, handsome man, with extremely red hair. As for his companion, it was of the keen-muzzled species used for shooting. Have you dined yet? asked the host. Yes, replied Platon. Indeed? What do you mean by coming here to laugh at us all? Do I ever go to your place after dinner? The newcomer smiled. Well, if it can bring you any comfort, he said, let me tell you that I ate nothing at the meal, for I had no appetite. But you should see what I have caught, what sort of a sturgeon fate has brought my way. Yes, and what crucians and carp. Really, it tires one to hear you. 
how come you always have to be so cheerful and how come you always have to be so gloomy retorted the host how you ask simply because i am so the truth is that you don't eat enough try the plan of making a good dinner weariness of everything is a modern invention once upon a time one never heard of it well boast away but have you yourself never been tired of things never in my life i do not so much as know whether i should find time to be tired in the morning when one awakes the cook is waiting and the dinner has to be ordered then one drinks one's morning tea and then the bailiff arrives for his orders and then there is fishing to be done and then one's dinner has to be eaten next before one has even had the chance to utter a snore there enters once again the cook and one has to order supper and when she has departed behold back she comes with a request for the following day's dinner what time does that leave one to be weary of things throughout this conversation chichikov had been taking stock of the newcomer who astonished him with his good looks his upright picturesque figure his appearance of fresh unwasted youthfulness and the boyish purity innocence and clarity of his features neither passion nor care nor aught of the nature of agitation or anxiety of mind had ventured to touch his unsullied face or to lay a single wrinkle thereon yet the touch of life which these emotions might have imparted was wanting the face was as it were dreaming even though from time to time an ironical smile disturbed it i too cannot understand remarked chichikov how a man of your appearance can find things wearisome of course if a man is hard pressed for money or if he has enemies who are lying in wait for his life as have certain folk whom i know well then believe me when i say interrupted the handsome guest that for the sake of a diversion i should be glad of any sort of an anxiety would that some enemy would conceive a grudge against me but no one does so everything remains eternally dull but perhaps you lack a sufficiency of land or souls not at all i and my brother own ten thousand desiatins of land and over a thousand souls the desiatin is two point eight six english acres curious i do not understand it but perhaps the harvest has failed or you have sickness about and many of your male peasants have died of it on the contrary everything is in splendid order for my brother is the best of managers then to find things wearisome exclaimed chichikov it passes my comprehension and he shrugged his shoulders well we will soon put weariness to flight interrupted the host alexashka do you run helter-skelter to the kitchen and there tell the cook to serve the fish pasties yes and where have that gawk of an emelian and that thief of an antoshka got to why have they not handed round the zakuski at this moment the door opened and the gawk and the thief in question made their appearance with napkins and a tray the latter bearing six decanters of variously coloured beverages these they placed upon the table and then ringed them about with glasses and platefuls of every conceivable kind of appetizer that done the servants applied themselves to bringing in various comestibles under covers through which could be heard the hissing of hot roast viands in particular did the gawk and the thief work hard at their tasks as a matter of fact their appellations had been given them merely to spur them to greater activity for in general the baron was no lover of abuse but rather a kind-hearted man who like most russians could not get on without a sharp word or two that is to say he needed them for his tongue as he needed a glass of vodka for his digestion what else could you expect it was his nature to care for nothing mild to the zakuski succeeded the meal itself and the host became a perfect glutton on his guest's behalf should he notice that a guest had taken but a single piece of a comestible he added thereto another one saying without a mate 
neither man nor bird can live in this world. Should any one take two pieces, he added there to a third, saying, What is the good of the number two? God loves the Trinity. Should any one take three pieces, he would say, Where do you see a wagon with three wheels? Who builds a three-cornered hut? Lastly, should any one take four pieces, he would cap them with a fifth, and add thereto the punning quip, Napiat opiat, that is, one more makes five. After devouring at least twelve steaks of sturgeon, Chichikov ventured to think to himself, My host cannot possibly add to them, but found that he was mistaken, for, without a word, Pietro heaped upon his plate an enormous portion of spit-roasted veal, and also some kidneys. And what veal it was! That calf was fed two years on milk, he exclaimed. I cared for it like my own son. Nevertheless, I can eat no more, said Chichikov. Do you try the veal before you say that you can eat no more? But I could not get it down my throat. There is no room left. If there be no room in the church for newcomer, the beadle is sent for, and room is very soon made. Yes, even though before there was such a crush that an apple couldn't have been dropped between the people. Do you try the veal, I say. That piece is the tit-bit of all. So Chichikov made the attempt, and in very truth the veal was beyond all praise, and room was found for it, even though one would have supposed the feat impossible. Fancy this good fellow removing to St. Petersburg or Moscow, said the guest to himself. Why, with a scale of living like this, he would be ruined in three years. For that matter, Pietuch might well have been ruined already, for hospitality can dissipate a fortune in three months as easily it can in three years. The host also dispensed the wine with a lavish hand, and what the guest did not drink he gave to his sons, who thus swallowed glass after glass. Indeed, even before coming to table, it was possible to discern to what department of human accomplishment their bent was turned. When the meal was over, however, the guests had no mind to further drinking. Indeed, it was all that they could do to drag themselves onto the balcony and there to relapse into easy chairs. Indeed, the moment that the host subsided into his seat, it was large enough for four, he fell asleep, and his portly presence, converting itself into a sort of blacksmith's bellows, started to vent, through open mouth and distended nostrils, such sounds as can have greeted the reader's ear but seldom, sounds as of a drum being beaten, in combination with the whistling of a flute and the strident howling of a dog. Listen to him said Platon. Chichikov smiled. Naturally, on such dinners as that, continued the other, our host does not find the time dull, and as soon as dinner is ended, there can ensue sleep. Yes, but pardon me, I still fail to understand why you should find life wearisome. There are so many resources against ennui. As, for instance, for a young man, dancing, the playing of one or another musical instrument, and, well, yes, marriage. Marriage to whom? To some maiden who is both charming and rich. Are there none in these parts? No. Then, were I you, I should travel and seek a maiden elsewhere. And a brilliant idea therewith entered Chichikov's head. This last resource, he ended, is the best of all resources against ennui. What resource are you speaking of? Of travel. But whither? Well, should it so please you, you might join me as my companion. This said, the speaker added to himself as he eyed Platon, Yes, that would suit me exactly, for then I should have half my expenses paid, and could charge him also with the cost of mending the coriasca. And whither should we go? In that respect, I am not wholly my own master, as I have business to do for others as well as for myself. For instance, General Bestrischev, an intimate friend, and I might add, 
a generous benefactor of mine, has charged me with commissions to certain of his relatives. However, though relatives are relatives, I am travelling likewise on my own account, since I wish to see the world and the worldly gig of humanity, which, in spite of what people may say, is as good as a living book or a second education. As a matter of fact, Chichikov was reflecting, yes, the plan is an excellent one. I might even contrive that he should have to bear the whole of our expenses, and that his horses should be used while my own should be put out to graze on his farm. Well, why should I not adopt the suggestion, was Platon's thought. There is nothing to do for me at home, since the management of the estate is in my brother's hands, and my going would cause him no inconvenience. Yes, why should I not do as Chichikov has suggested? Then, he added aloud, would you come and stay with my brother for a couple of days? Otherwise, he might refuse me his consent. With great pleasure, said Chichikov, or even for three days. Then here is my hand on it. Let us be off at once. Platon seemed suddenly to have come to life again. Where are you off to? put in their host unexpectedly, as he roused himself and stared in astonishment at the pair. No, no, my good sirs. I have had the wheels removed from your Kolyaska, Monsieur Chichikov, and have sent your horse, Platon Mikhailich, to a grazing ground fifteen versts away. Consequently, you must spend the night here and depart tomorrow morning after breakfast. What could be done with a man like Piotr? There was no help for it but to remain. In return, the guests were rewarded with a beautiful spring evening, for, to spend the time, the host organised a boating expedition on the river, and a dozen rowers, with a dozen pairs of oars, conveyed the party, to the accompaniment of song, across the smooth surface of the lake, and up a great river with towering banks. From time to time the boat would pass under ropes, stretched across for purposes of fishing, and at each turn of the rippling current new vistas unfolded themselves as tier upon tier of woodland delighted the eye with a diversity of timber and foliage. In unison did the rowers ply their sculls, yet it was the row of itself that the skiff shot forward, bird-like, over the glassy surface of the water, while at intervals the broad-shouldered young oarsman, who was seated third from the bow, would raise, as from a nightingale's throat, the opening staves of a boat song, and then be joined by five or six more, until the melody had come to pour forth in a volume of as free and boundless as Russia herself. And Piotr, too, would give himself a shake, and help lustily to support the chorus and even Chichikov felt acutely conscious of the fact that he was a Russian. Only Platon reflected, What is there so splendid in these melancholy songs? They do but increase one's depression of spirits. The journey homeward was made in the gathering dusk. Rhythmically, the oars smote a surface which no longer reflected the sky, and darkness had fallen when they reached the shore, along which lights were twinkling where the fisher-folk were boiling live eels for soup. Everything had now wended its way homeward for the night. The cattle and the poultry had been housed, and the herdsmen, standing at the gates of the village cattle pens, amid the trailing dust lately raised by their charges, were awaiting the milk pails and a summons to partake of the eel broth. Through the dusk came the hum of humankind, and the barking of dogs in other and more distant villages, while over all the moon was rising, and the darkened countryside was beginning to glimmer to light again under her beams. What a glorious picture! Yet no one thought of admiring it. Instead of galloping over the countryside, on frisky cobs, Nikolasha and Alexashka were engaged in dreaming of Moscow, with its confectioner's shops, and the theatres of which a cadet, newly arrived on a visit from the capital, had just been telling them, while their father had his mind full of how best to stuff his guests with yet more food, and Platon was given up to yawning. Only in Chichikov was a spice of animation visible. Yes, he reflected, some day I too 
will become lord of such a country place. And before his mind's eye there arose also a helpmeet and some little chichikovs. By the time that supper was finished, the party had again overeaten themselves, and when Chichikov entered the room allotted him for the night, he lay down upon the bed and prodded his stomach. It is as tight as a drum, he said to himself. Not another tip bit of veal could now get into it. Also, circumstances had so brought it about that next door to him there was situated his host's apartment, and since the intervening wall was thin, Chichikov could hear every word that was said there. At the present moment, the master of the house was engaged in giving the cook orders for what, under the guise of an early breakfast, promised to constitute a veritable dinner. You should have heard Pyotr's behests. They would have excited the appetite of a corpse. Yes, he said, sucking his lips and drawing a deep breath. In the first place, Make a pasty in four divisions. Into one of the divisions, put the sturgeon's cheeks and some viaziga, that is, dried spinal marrow of the sturgeon. And into another division, some buckwheat porridge, young mushrooms and onions, sweet milk, calves' brains, and anything else that you may find suitable, anything else that you may have got handy. Also, bake the pastry to a nice brown on one side, and but lightly on the other. Yes, and as to the underside, bake it so that it will be all juicy and flaky, so that it shall not crumble into bits, but melt in the mouth like the softest snow that ever you heard of. And as he said this, Pyotr fairly smacked his lips. The devil take him, muttered Chichikov, thrusting his head beneath the bedclothes to avoid hearing more. The fellow won't give one a chance to sleep. Nevertheless, he heard through the blankets, and garnished the sturgeon with beetroot, smelts, peppered mushrooms, young radishes, carrots, beans, and anything else that you like, so as to have plenty of trimmings. Yes, and put a lump of ice into the pig's bladder, so as to swell it up. Many other dishes did Pietuch order, and nothing was to be heard but his talk of boiling, roasting, and stewing. Finally, just as mention was being made of a turkey cock, Chichikov fell asleep. Next morning, the guest state of repletion had reached the point of Platon being unable to mount his horse, wherefore the latter was dispatched homeward with one of Pyotr's grooms, and the two guests entered Chichikov's koliaska. Even the dog trotted lazily in the rear, for he too had overeaten himself. It has been rather too much of a good thing, remarked Chichikov, as the vehicle issued from the courtyard. Yes, and it vexes me to see the fellow never tire of it, replied Platon. Ah, thought Chichikov to himself, if I had an income of seventy thousand roubles, as you have, I'd very soon give tiredness one in the eye. Take Murazov, the tax farmer. He again must be worth ten millions. What a fortune! Do you mind where we drive? asked Platon. I should like first to go and take leave of my sister and my brother-in-law. With pleasure, said Chichikov. My brother-in-law is the leading landowner hereabouts. At the present moment, he is drawing an income of two hundred thousand roubles from a property which eight years ago was producing a bare twenty thousand. Truly a man worthy of the utmost respect. I shall be most interested to make his acquaintance. To think of it, and what may his family name be? Constant Joglo. And his Christian name and patronymic? Constantine Theodorovich. Constantine Theodorovich Constant Joglo. Yes, it will be a most interesting event to make his acquaintance. To know such a man must be a whole education. Here. Platon set himself to give Selifan some directions as to the way, a necessary proceeding in view of the fact that Selifan could hardly maintain his seat on the box. Twice Petrushka too had fallen headlong, and this necessitated being tied to his perch with a piece of rope. What a clown! had been Chichikov's only comment. This is where my brother-in-law's land begins, said Platon. They give one a change of view. 
and indeed from this point the countryside became planted with timber the rows of trees running as straight as pistol shots and having beyond them and on higher ground a second expensive forest newly planted like the first while beyond it again loomed a third plantation of older trees next there succeeded a flat piece of the same nature all this timber said platon has grown up within eight or ten years at the most whereas on another man's land it would have taken twenty to attain the same growth and how has your brother-in-law effected this you must ask him yourself he is so excellent a husbandman that nothing ever fails with him you see he knows the soil and also knows what ought to be planted beside what and what kinds of timber are the best neighbourhood for grain again everything on his estate is made to be perform at least three or four different functions for instance he makes his timber not only serve as timber but also serve as provider of moisture and shade to a given stretch of land and then as a fertiliser with its fallen leaves consequently when everywhere else there is drought he still has water and when everywhere else there has been a failure of the harvest on his lands it will have proved a success but it is a pity that i know so little about it all as to be unable to explain to you his many expedients folk call him a wizard for he produces so much nevertheless personally i find what he does uninteresting truly an astonishing fellow reflected chichikov with a glance at his companion it is sad indeed to see a man so superficial as to be unable to explain matters of this kind at length the manor appeared in sight an establishment looking almost like a town so numerous were the huts where they stood arranged in three tiers crowned with three churches and surrounded with huge ricks and barns yes thought chichikov to himself one can see what a jewel of a landowner lives here the huts in question were stoutly built and the intervening alleys well laid out while wherever a wagon was visible it looked serviceable and more or less new also the local peasants bore an intelligent look on their faces the cattle were of the best possible breed and even the peasants pigs belonged to the poor kind aristocracy clearly there dwelt here peasants who to quote the song were accustomed to pick up silver by the shovelful nor were englishified gardens and parterres and other conceits in evidence but on the contrary there ran an open view from the manor house to the farm buildings and the workmen's cots so that after the old russian fashion the baron should be able to keep an eye upon all that was going on around him for the same purpose the mansion was topped with a tall lantern and the superstructure a device designed not for ornament nor for a vantage spot for a contemplation of the view but for supervision of the labourers engaged in distant fields lastly the brisk active servant who received the visitors on the veranda were very different menials from the drunken petrushka even though they did not wear swallow-tailed coats but only Cossack Czech Manu, a blue homespun cloth, Czech Manu being long belted Tartar blouses. The lady of the house also issued onto the veranda, with her face of the freshness of blood and milk and the brightness of God's daylight. She as nearly resembled Platon as one pea resembles another, save that, whereas he was languid, she was cheerful and full of talk good day brother she cried how glad i am to see you constantine is not at home but will be back presently where is he doing business in the village with a party of factors replied the lady as she conducted her guest to the drawing-room with no little curiosity did chichikov gaze at the interior of the mansion inhabited by the man who received an annual income of two hundred thousand roubles for he thought to discern therefrom the nature of its proprietor even as from a shell one may deduce the species of oyster or snail which has been its tenant and has left therein its impression but no such conclusions were to be drawn the rooms were simple and even bare not a fresco nor a picture 
nor a bronze, nor a flower, nor a china what-not, nor a book was there to be seen. In short, everything appeared to show that the proprietor of this abode spent the greater part of his time, not between four walls, but in the field, and that he thought out his plans, not in sybaritic fashion by the fireside, nor in an easy chair beside the stove, but on the spot where work was actually in progress, that, in a word, where these plans were conceived, there they were put into execution. Nor in these rooms could Chichikov detect the least trace of a feminine hand, beyond the fact that certain tables and chairs bore drying boards, whereupon were arranged some sprinklings of flower petals. "'What is all this rubbish for?' asked Platon. It is not rubbish, replied the lady of the house. On the contrary, it is the best possible remedy for fever. Last year we cured every one of our sick peasants with it. Some of the petals I am going to make into an ointment, and some into an infusion. You may laugh as much as you like at my potting and preserving, yet you yourself will be glad of things of the kind when you set out on your travels. Platon moved to the piano and began to pick out a note or two. "'Good Lord, what an ancient instrument!' he exclaimed. "'Are you not ashamed of it, sister? "'Well, the truth is that I get no time to practice my music. "'You see,' she added to Chichikov, "'I have an eight-year-old daughter to educate, "'and to hand her over to a foreign governess "'in order that I may have leisure for my own piano playing. "'Well, that is a thing which I could never bring myself to do. "'You have become a wearisome sort of person,' commented Platon, and walked away to the window. "'Ah, here comes Constantine, presently,' he added. Chichikov also glanced out of the window, and saw approaching the veranda a brisk, swarthy-complexioned man of about forty, a man clad in a rough cloth jacket and a velveteen cap. Evidently, he was one of those who care little for the niceties of dress. With him, bareheaded, there came a couple of men of a somewhat lower station in life, and all three were engaged in an animated discussion. One of the baron's two companions was a plain peasant, and the other, clad in a blue Siberian smock, a travelling factor. The fact that the party halted a while by the entrance steps made it possible to overhear a portion of their conversation from within. This is what you peasants had better do, the baron was saying. Purchase your release from your present master. I will lend you the necessary money, and afterwards you can work for me. No, Constantine Theodorovitch, replied the peasant. Why should we do that? Remove us just as we are. You will know how to arrange it, for a cleverer gentleman than you is nowhere to be found. The misfortune of us muzhiks is that we cannot protect ourselves properly. The tavern keepers sell us such liquor that, before a man knows where he is, a glassful of it has eaten a hole through his stomach and made him feel as though he could drink a pail of water. Yes, it knocks a man over before he can look around. Everywhere temptation lies in wait for the peasant, and he needs to be cunning if he is to get through the world at all. In fact, things seem to be contrived for nothing but to make us peasants lose our wits even to the tobacco which they sell us. What are folk like ourselves to do, Constantine Theodorovitch? I tell you, it is terribly difficult for a muzhik to look after himself. Listen to me. This is how things are done here. When I take on a serf, I fit him out with a cow and a horse. On the other hand, I demand of him thereafter more than is demanded of a peasant anywhere else. That is to say, first and foremost, I make him work. Whether a peasant be working for himself or for me, never do I let him waste time. I myself toil like a bullock, and I force my peasants to do the same, for experience has taught me that this is the only way to get through life. All the mischief in the world comes through lack of employment. Now do you go and consider the matter, and talk it over with your mere, mere being the village commune. We have done that already, Constantine Theodorovitch, and our elders' opinion is there is no need for further talk. 
Every peasant belonging to Konstantin Theodorovitch is well off and hasn't to work for nothing. The priests of his village, too, are men of good heart, whereas ours have been taken away and there is no one to bury us. Nevertheless, do you go and talk the matter over again. We will, Baron. Here the factor who had been walking on the Baron's other side put in a word. Konstantin Theodorovitch, he said, I beg of you to do as I have requested. I had told you before, replied the Baron, that I do not care to play the huckster. I am not one of those landowners whom fellows of your sort visit on the very day that the interest on a mortgage is due. Ah, I know your fraternity thoroughly, and know that you keep lists of all who have mortgages to repay. But what is there so clever about that? Any man, if you pinch him sufficiently, will surrender you a mortgage at half price. Any man, that is to say, except myself, who care nothing for your money. Were a loan of mine to remain out three years, I should never demand a kopeck of interest on it. Quite so, Konstantin Theodorovitch, replied the factor. But I am asking this of you, more for the purpose of establishing us on a business footing, than because I desire to win your favour. Pray, therefore, accept this earnest money of three thousand roubles. And the man drew from his breast pocket a dirty roll of banknotes, which, carelessly receiving, Constant Joglo thrust, uncounted, into the back pocket of his overcoat. Hmm, thought Chichikov. For all he cares, the notes might have been a handkerchief. When Constant Joglo appeared at closer quarters, that is to say, in the doorway of the drawing room, he struck Chichikov more than ever with the swarthiness of his complexion the dishevelment of his black, slightly grizzled locks, the alertness of his eye, and the impression of fiery southern origin which his old personality diffused. For he was not wholly a Russian, nor could he himself say precisely who his forefathers had been. Yet, inasmuch as he accounted genealogical research no part of the science of estate management, but a mere superfluity, he looked upon himself as, to all intents and purposes, a native of russia and the more so since the russian language was the only tongue he knew platon presented chichikov and the pair exchanged greetings to get rid of my depression constantine continued platon i am thinking of accompanying our guest on a tour through a few of the provinces an excellent idea said constant joglo but precisely whither he added turning hospitably to chichikov to tell you the truth, replied that personage with an affable inclination of the head, as he smoothed the arm of his chair with his hand, I am travelling less on my own affairs than on the affairs of others. That is to say, General Patrischev, an intimate friend, and I might add, a generous benefactor of mine, has charged me with commissions to some of his relatives. Nevertheless, though relatives are relatives, I may say that I am travelling on my own account as well, in that, in addition to possible benefit to my health, I desire to see the world and the whirligig of humanity which constitutes, so to speak, a living book, a second course of education. Yes, there is no harm in looking at other corners of the world beside one's own. You speak truly. There is no harm in such a proceeding. Thereby, one may see things which one has not before encountered. One may meet men with whom one has not before come in contact. And with some men of that kind, a conversation is as precious a benefit as has been conferred upon me by the present occasion. I come to you, most worthy Konstantin Theodorovitch, for instruction, and again for instruction, and I beg of you to assuage my thirst with an exposition of the truth as it is. I hunger for the favour of your words as for manner. But how so? What can I teach you? exclaimed Compton Joglo in confusion. I myself was given but the plainest of educations. Nay, most worthy sir, you possess wisdom, and again wisdom. Wisdom can only direct the management of a... Nay, most worthy sir, you possess wisdom, and again wisdom. 
Wisdom only can direct the management of a great estate that can derive a sound income from the same, that can acquire wealth of a real, not a fictitious order, while also fulfilling the duties of a citizen, and thereby earning the respect of the Russian public. All this I pray you to teach me. I tell you what, said Constant Joblo, looking meditatively at his guest. You had better stay with me for a few days, and during that time I can show you how things are managed here, and explain to you everything. Then you will see for yourself that no great wisdom is required for purpose. Yes, certainly you must stay here, put in the lady of the house. Then, turning to her brother, she added, And you too must stay. Why should you be in such a hurry? Very well, he replied. But what say you, Paul Ivanovitch? I say the same as you, and with much pleasure, replied Chichikov. But also, I ought to tell you this, that there is a relative of General Batrishchev's, a certain Colonel Koshkarev. Yes, we know him, but he is quite mad. As you say, he is mad, and I should not have been intending to visit him, were it not that General Batrishchev is an intimate friend of mine, as well as, I might add, my most generous benefactor. Then, said Constant Joglo, do you go and see Colonel Koshkara now? He lives less than ten versts from here, and I have a gig already harnessed. Go to him at once, and return here for tea. An excellent idea, cried Chichikov, and with that he seized his cap. End of part two, chapter three, section one.